2022 environmental board meeting. Uh, before we get started with our agenda, I have a few prepared things that we need to discuss. Due to the virtual format of today's meeting, I'd like to start by providing some guidelines. We have participants attending by computers and others who may be attending by phone. For all meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. If you're having technical issues, try joining the meeting using a different device, such as a smartphone or tablet, or you can use the call-in information in the meeting invite to call into the meeting. And since I didn't introduce myself, I'll start by doing that before we go much further. I'm Nancy Davidson, and I am the chair of the Environmental Board, and my apologies for not introducing myself right off the bat. With that, um, I would like to move into the attendance, and I'll turn it over to Stacy to do a roll call for us, please. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, Tom Anderson. Here. Surya Bala Pragada. Here. Uh, Nancy Davidson. Here. Jamie Finch. Here. Cameron Fisher. Yeah. Rishi Hazra. Here. Dan Hintz. Here. Laura Labego. Here. Danny Maiden. And Don McWilliams. Here. Ann Newcomb. Here. And Janet Wall. Great. Um, after the roll call now, I'd like to um, give a few um, points for the board. To indicate a desire to speak, please send a chat to all panelists and type question or comment. And then I will work to try and acknowledge you as the chair. Do not put any substantive comments in the chat. For if anyone has to call back in on the phone, um, we'll, Stacy will be intermittently checking to see with, with you to see if you have any comments. You can also press star three to raise your hand. So now we're moving on approval of minutes and we received the minutes of January 12th, 2022. Does anybody have any comments or feedback on that? Please indicate in the chat box. Seeing no comments, but is there comments? I heard something, I apologize. Um, hearing none, um, the minutes of the January 12th, 2022 um, board meeting have been approved. We're moving on to agenda item number three, which is public comments. And before we begin, I'd like to give a few guidelines for public comments. Public comments are an important part of the public process. We take them seriously and factor them into the decisions that we make. For members of the public joining us, welcome. If there's anyone in the meeting now who would like to make public comments, please raise your virtual hand. To do this, if you are on the phone, please press star three. If you have joined by computer or smartphone, look for the hand icon. This varies by device. One option may be to go to the participant panel and select your name, then choose raise hand. It may also be located under the reactions menu or more menu. And with that, I'll ask Stacy if anyone has identified an interest in providing public comments for this meeting. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, it looks like we do have one member of the public attending. I did not receive any comments in advance of the meeting, and I do not see a hand raised. Um, but if you are a member of the public and are interested in speaking and having trouble raising your hand, feel free to send me a chat. All right, I'm not seeing anything, Nancy. Okay, great, thank you very much. With that, we'll move into the agenda items. And first on the agenda is an update from the Parks and Community Services Department. And with us tonight are Jeff Watling, the Director, and Jennifer Fink, the Parks Planning and Projects Administrator. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy to provide better um, introductions. Thank you. Great, thanks Nancy. Um, I just wanted to really thank our parks team for coming to talk with the environmental board tonight. We wanted to provide this presentation to you all as sort of an introductory to the work that they've been doing 
and tee up a few items that the board might be interested in engaging in uh, this year and potentially next year. Um, so as you do listen to the overview of the strategic plan, as well as some of the work on their projects, do consider where we might want to further engage with the park staff, as well as possibly the parks board. Um, and in specific, uh, specifically, we'd really be interested in hearing thoughts around engagement when it comes to topics such as land acquisition, wildlife corridors, or anything else that piques your interest tonight. So with that, I think I'll be handing it over to Jennifer to start the presentation. Thank you very much, Stacey. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Fink, and I'm going to first pass it off to Jeff Watling. Uh, he's going to start us off with our first topic while I do a quick screen share. So excuse the tag team here. No, appreciate it, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, the introduction. Um, uh, great to see a number of you that I already know and, and terrific to meet those of you I don't know yet. Um, thanks so much for uh, having us. Uh, yeah, Stacy said, um, our hope tonight is really one of uh, introduction. A chance, uh, it sounds like you have a number of. Of um, questions and had some interest in, in, I think, getting a little better understanding of the park strategic plan and some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, sort of through that environmental lens, we hope to, uh, Jennifer and I hope to provide you that um, overview. Uh, forgive me, I can get pretty excited and nerdy about the park strategic plan, so I'll try and uh, give a pretty high level overview uh, to leave ample room for any questions, uh, discussion, um, conversation that you all want to have um, as a board. Um, so I'll, as Jennifer said, start with a little bit of an overview of the park strategic plan, then pass it over to Jennifer on a couple of other um, uh, specific project topics. So the park strategic plan, um, and thanks Jen for uh, serving as the driver of the, the PowerPoint here. Um, this is something that we started in early 2017 with a lot of, of community engagement. Um, you can stick with that first slide, thanks. Um, um, it was then adopted in the middle of about June of 2018. Uh, the intention of this document uh, was really, rather than, you know, historically the city had had a park plan, but it was sort of a park by park, um, very um, analytical description of sort of what we have. It didn't tell the story or speak of the strategy of what, what, what do we want the park system to do? What does this community want? Um, its park system to accomplish? How does it want uh, its park system to perform? And so with that in mind, uh, this really was a, a goal to set a vision for the whole system. Um, yes, look par park by park, but really understand uh, community need, um, how, again, it wants uh, this system to provide all aspects of a park. Um, I would imagine if we went even through this group of, of residents and asked, what, how do you define a park? What's important to you? Uh, you might um, see parks um, and prioritize different park users uh, or park uses. Um, so parks are many things to many people and how do we um, sort of bring that all together uh, to establish a, a vision and a game plan and not just a vision, but um, as you'll see um, in the next slide, once we go there, um, we really tried to identify what are the themes that we're hearing from community engagement, and then how do those, do those themes really become threads through this whole document um, and helping to identify projects, projects uh, within our existing park spaces, uh, projects within future park needs and future park spaces, and then how do we prioritize those projects? Uh, within the plan, if you've spent any time in it, uh, you'll see that uh, it's a really extensive list of, of projects. It's a vision that's meant to be a 20, 25 year vision. Um, so looking at the long view, uh, prioritizing those projects into near term, mid term and long term buckets, um, and then letting those near term projects really inform the, the parks capital um, improvement plan, the six year CIP, which then becomes um, um, capital bu uh, budgets, capital uh, priorities that the city council sets uh, year after year. So uh, the, the premise of this document is really to take the long view vision, but, but prioritize that vision so it really informs annual, um, annual decisions um, on investments. 
Uh, next slide, Jen. And as, as we're transitioning that slide, I think one more just sort of big picture reference of, of this strategic plan, much like other, other strategic plan elements, the climate action plan uh, that you all uh, just worked on with staff, terrific job with that. Um, as I said, it's this long view vision, but intended to be updated about every six years. So hard to believe 2018, this was adopted. Um, before we know it, uh, we'll be starting uh, here in 2023 on an update and uh, certainly something we work very closely with the park board, but I would imagine now with an environmental board, um, a number of other uh, boards that will wanna be uh, interested in, in that update. Um, so we, we all have that to look forward to. But a little bit on uh, more on the 2018 plan. Um, so the themes I, I mentioned um, themes really became the threads of the document. Uh, these are five themes that um, the community engagement, community and voices really uh, began to call out. Um, going through them somewhat quickly, uh, placemaking uh, this idea of how do we work closely with the community on project. Um, 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 specific uh, work and planning efforts uh, to reinvest in our existing public spaces, um, our existing parks, our existing trails. Some of them are rather tired. Um, are they still the vibrant, um, active places that uh, the city wants them to be? In some cases, they're not. And, and it's going to be through reinvestment, really smart, intelligent, community-led uh, reinvestment um, that those become the places uh, that people connect and feel vibrant in. Speaking of connect connectivity, um, how do we not just see our park system as dots on the map uh, that you have to drive to, but how are they both dots and threads, if you will? And the connectivity is the threads of the system. Um, how do we connect within the city to our parks? But then uh, you'll hear me speak a little bit later about this idea of inside out. How do we also connect to this amazing um, realm of public lands, um, regional public lands that surround us. Uh, innovative action was another important thread. How do we think creatively? Um, how do we not just lean on city resources? How do we foster partnerships? Um, how do we achieve, achieve more um, and, and greater public good through those partnerships um, and through really trying to be smart with uh, financial sustainability? Um, how do we make investments, but also look at um, the long-term needs for sustainability of, of taking care of what we have. Um, and again, doing that through uh, partnerships in a variety of ways. Vital environment, um, certainly something I think at the heart of the environmental board, but we are managers and stewards of um, a vast amount of, of really, really important public land and natural resource land, forested hillsides, um, critical areas within uh, the 16 plus 100 acres um, uh, that um, makes up the city park system. How do we balance active and passive recreation needs? Um, and, and this was important without thinking them as separate entities. Um, I, I think that's a, a really important item that came out of this park plan is um, active and passive priorities and needs are not mutually exclusive. Um, it's one system that that um, we want to be smart about um, uh, weaving in both um, active and passive and doing that in a way that really um, celebrates, uh, protects, um, reinvests in, in um, the environment. And then last theme was active lifestyles, understanding that, again, parks, uh, this is a very active community. And what um, certain people want uh, to do uh, to stay active is different than what others want. Um, so how are we understanding this variety of activity that our park system needs to try and, and support, whether that is um, athletic fields, whether that's trailheads to connect to, to trails, whether that's play spaces and dog parks and um, tennis courts and pickleball courts and all variety of, of active elements that uh, this community uh, wants within its city park system. Next slide, Jen. So those five themes, like I said, really became the threads that helped to inform um, um, not only the projects, but then um, how those projects are prioritized uh, within the plan. Um, this is, is one page within the park plan. I, I don't wanna uh, draw too specific into it, other than uh, they, were, they were really good visuals that I think helped 
um, outline one of the one of the narratives of the park plan. And, and I, as I said earlier, this idea of connectivity and thinking um, of both a park system that supports in the city and outside the city, and this sort of inside outside um, reality. The the map on the upper right sort of shows um, this relationship with. Um, Central Issaquah and Central Issaquah planning uh, that has uh, certainly been going on for, for a number of years here in the city. Um, you see its relationship with Greater Issaquah um, and, and Greater Issaquah meaning the, the Issaquah city boundary. And then this um, wonderful um, 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 ring of open space that, that surrounds uh, the city and, and both um, um, ownership by a number of public agencies, whether it's the city, uh, DNR, state parks, uh, King County. Um, and and um, it really became a, an important visual that um, helped reinforce a lot of the work of this park plan is that um, these concentric rings shouldn't be thought of separately. And when we start to think of a, of a park system, when we start to think of needs of central Issaquah and planning in central Issaquah, we didn't understand um, a majority of our current residents um, really li live um, in, in that outer edge of, of Greater Issaquah. And so how are we, when we think of things like the Green Necklace, when we think of, of connectivity, they're not exclusive to one of these concentric rings, but as we're really planning um, and connecting this city system and investing in the city system, we need to think about unifying all three of those, um, and how are we creating a system that um, um, not only connects to to all of those, but um, um, supports uh, residents throughout uh, throughout the community? The larger map, I'll just touch on. You know, one of the sort of the uh, um, um, anchor projects, if you will, of the plan. Uh, the, one of the the, the visions, uh, the I think the bigger, bolder visions of, of this plan was recognizing and in some ways celebrating the, the decades of investments that have created this north-south um, spine throughout the city. When you look at from Lake Sammamish, um, Lake Sammamish State Park, um, the East Lake Sammamish Trail, the Rainier Trail, um, and then a number of city investments made over the last three or four decades, um, it's not hard to imagine a connected corridor um, that unifies and has a really strong sort of public recreational thread um, throughout this entire city from, from the um, northern edge at Lake Sammamish all the way down to Squawk Valley Park on our, on our southern, southern border. And so uh, not something that happens overnight, not something that happens um, in one year, five years, 10 years, but how do we start to um, uh, take these investments over the last uh, three or four decades and um, think of it in a more unified way and, and really start to connect those, um, uh, those investments. Next slide, Jen. So these, these next two slides are really just, uh, I think a couple of examples of now that this park strategic plan is adopted, the, the intent was this wasn't just meant to be a pretty document, but something that really um, is active and informs um, capital planning, informs projects. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of um, uh, work elements that uh, really through an environmental lens um, um, are some, um, some projects that we've been doing these last, these last couple of years. One of the operational strategic goals of the plan uh, was how do we become better stewards of our, of our city-owned uh, public lands? Um, and at the same time, how do we understand the broader need for looking at, uh, at the city's urban forest? Now, the urban forest is so much more than just what the city owns. Um, the urban forest is the city's public land. Um, it's, it's private land. It's street trees. Um, um, it's a whole variety of things that make up the urban forest. But one of the things we really wanted to look at was are we being a good steward of the 1600 acres of forested um, parkland we own? And so we have partnered with uh, Forterra. If you're familiar with Forterra, they um, a number of, for a number of years now have, have um, um, had a green cities initiative where they partner with cities 
um, to take a look at specifically their city lands, their public lands, um, do an assessment and an evaluation acre by acre of those public lands um, and really start to, um, that really helps us start to draw a framework and, and prioritize where should we be targeting our, our work? Where, where is the, the city for urban forest most threatened? Uh, where is it um, being most choked out by invasives? Uh, where do we, what do we need to um, remove and, and restore? Uh, what are areas that are in really good shape that we need to steward different ways? And so um, that program started in 2019. Um, as the, the bullet showed, show even throughout the pandemic, we, we began doing some work. Um, a key part of this effort is um, identifying four stewards, um, sort of Uber volunteers, if you will, that uh, work with us. We train them up to um, adopt, if you will, an acre or two of, of really important critical um, land. And then through those stewards, um, a number of volunteer projects begin to take shape um, in those steward space, stewarded spaces. So we kicked off the forest steward program last year. Um, we have 10 stewards uh, that have, are, are up and, and getting trained. Um, we'll be doing some more steward outreach uh, later this year. Um, in 2021, we completed um, a 20 year implementation guide. And so that implementation guide is a lot of what I was, the work I was saying that we did with Forterra, where it's this acre by acre assessment of our 1600 acres, um, scoring and evaluating um, each of those acres to identify a strategy and a game plan uh, for how we want to start better stewarding that um, city owned land. So um, exciting efforts there. Um, um, again, much more work to do in broader urban forest management, but uh, we felt like this was one cornerstone uh, piece to, uh, to that work. Um, I know there was a question coming into tonight that I'll, I'll touch on now in terms of, um, I think, wildfire prevention, wildfire um, um, issues and concerns. Um, as part of the Green Issaquah effort, we, we brought Eastside Fire and Rescue into that conversation, uh, certainly knowing how we steward um, not only invasives, but the understory of, of our lands. Uh, that is certainly one important element. Um, Eastside Fire and Rescue um, is in process now of uh, resourcing up and looking at and beginning to uh, just on the, the, the beginning stages of doing some pretty aggressive work um, and some really impressive work on um, uh, wildfire prevention um, um, here in the in the coming months and um, through this year, uh, we'll certainly be playing a supportive role and, and we'll be taking part in that as, as the land managers. But um, I just wanted to point that out. Um, if you weren't aware of that, um, I think as an environmental board and, and if that's an area of interest, um, I think some of the work that Eastside Fire and Rescue is gonna be doing in the coming months could be, a, a, um, I'm sure a topic of interest uh, for all of you. Um, acquisitions are certainly something that um, I know were a bit of a question and look forward to maybe what your questions are uh, within the park strategic plan, um, uh, really identifying cri criteria and priorities for um, future acquisitions and strategic acquisitions within our park system uh, have been identified. Um, if uh, all of you, any of you are familiar with acquisitions, you know, as the city buys land, there's another, um, there's another part of that transaction that are most often private um, uh, private uh, property owners. And so with that sort of um, relationship, it's it's not often that, um, and it's not something that, that um, you know, I will be speaking of sort of parcel by parcel. There's not a map that we would identify that would show, here's the exact, you know, properties that we're looking for. Again, out of respect to um, the, the um, relationship with the, a, a prospective um, uh, seller uh, being a, a, a private uh, private property owner. Um, all that to say though, um, there are certainly a lot of uh, prior criteria and priorities that help govern our um, um, acquisition efforts. Um, a number of those on the environmental side is how do we look strategically at connecting to our open lands around us, but how do we also uh, look at protecting forested hillsides um, uh, an effort that was accomplished in 2019. If you're familiar with the, the what's known as the Berg, Bergsma acquisition, um, it's now um, Harvey Manning Park, 
um, on the um, the edge of, of Cougar Mountain uh, that really um, will become the gateway uh, property um, of um, connecting this, the valley floor, the Issaquah Valley floor up into not only Talus, uh, but uh, the greater regional Cougar Mountain system beyond it. Um, a very successful effort, um, a very um, um, intricate effort in partnering with, with uh, King County, um, and a number of other grant agencies to make that acquisition happen. But um, again, the park strategic plan and some of the priorities and goals of that plan really help to um, inform and prioritize that acquisition. Um, another priority we have within the strategic plan is looking at um, uh, Creekside, uh, both for protection of Issaquah Creek and working with our uh, partners in public works in terms of both floodplain, uh, surface stormwater, but also connectivity. Uh, goals for uh, furthering um, the valley trail system and, and trail connections. Next slide, Jen. Um, a couple of, of capital projects that I wanted to just highlight really quickly. Sometimes um, environmental benefits um, um, show themselves in a variety of ways. And so this, this next example is as we um, own and manage Central Park, um, up on the Issaquah Highlands. Um, you may be familiar with that park. Those of you that are know that we have two um, um, pads of athletic fields that comprise four now um, synthetic turf fields. Um, pad three, which is the, the lower area, um, was the, the turf was aging out and needed uh, replacement um, as an effort that we did last year um, in understanding um, the industry has come a long ways. If you're familiar with synthetic turf, um, you know, the origins of synthetic turf and the infill was um, really solely 10 years ago, crumb rubber, petroleum-based um, crumb rubber uh, that made up a, a big part of this infill. Um, the industry has come a long, long ways, uh, the turf industry in uh, looking at um, um, alternatives uh, for uh, for infill. As we worked with the park board, as we worked with mayor and administration and city council, we felt uh, this turf replacement was a real strategic time to pilot um, a different type of infill. And and how might we get away from uh, petroleum based um, uh, rubber, you know, crumb rubber infill to an all organic option? And so, uh, as that project was completed last year, um, not only um, is it a new synthetic turf field that the community is enjoying, but um, it's also um, a much more environmentally friendly um, 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 asset in that it's an all organic infill. Uh, it's now a mix of, of cork and sand uh, that make up that infill. And so we're excited to pilot that to see so far the community's responded really well to the performance of it. Um, and we're hopeful as we We'll need to replace uh, the other synthetic turf in future years that we're able to really look at um, a, a commitment to go away from that um, uh, petroleum based crub rubber to um, all organic. Uh, last um, couple projects to highlight uh, trail connectivity, which I, I mentioned earlier. Um, we accomplished a, a couple. Um, um, small but but really powerful and important uh, trail improvements uh, this last year. Um, East Sunset Way, if you're familiar with that trailhead that uh, really heads up onto West Tiger and Tradition Plateau, uh, we were able to first partner on a, a small but very strategic acquisition with Department of Natural Resources, State DNR, and with that acquisition, we're able to accomplish um, some trail improvements that separated bike use and pedestrian use, created a much safer a way to get out of that trailhead and uh, community certainly responding well uh, to that. And I think with that separation of use, also a, a much more environmentally friendly um, 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 sort of gateway from that, that trailhead. Uh, and then last item to just touch on real quickly, the Squawk Mountain Access Trail is, a, if you're familiar with that, it's a trail that is just south of Mine Hill Trail as you're um, sort of heading south from Newport Way. Um, um, along the Issaquah Creek, um, there was um, some very tired and aging out um, assets um, to that trail as you were near the Kilkari 
uh, project. We partnered with uh, the Kilkari project and um, accomplished some, some much needed uh, trail improvements there. And I think with that, um, I'm gonna hand it off to, to Jen for a couple other highlights. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jennifer Fink, uh, Park Planner and Project Ad Administrator, and I'm here to talk about our Million Trees grant and some of the good work we were able to accomplish um, with this grant. Here you see our WCC work crew out there helping us uh, get going out at Inge Johnson uh, Park and doing some restoration work. So the Million Trees Grant was a King County grant with an overall effort to plant 1 million trees countywide. Um, the city was awarded $75,000 with a goal to try and plant 10,000 trees. And in order to get this work done, um, we ended up partnering with the Washington Conservation Corps and Mountains of Sound Greenway Trust. Uh, we are awarded this grant in 2019 pre-pandemic and um, obviously, when we had gathering restrictions through the pandemic, um, planting efforts were and gatherings were very challenged. And so getting this work completed took a little longer than we anticipated originally, but fortunately, we were able to fulfill our grant requirements. Uh, throughout the city, we were able to do infill and new area plantings on 21.15 acres in six city parks and open space areas. The sites we worked at were Pickering Reach, Sammamish Cove, which if you drive by um, I-90 and you get that peekaboo look out at Lake Sammamish, there's a whole bunch of reed canary grass. It's an area out there. Inge Johnson Park, Park Point, our Issaquah Creek Greenway area, as well as Squawk Valley Park North. Um, as you can see here, we, new plantings are flagged, so we knew where they are. <laughs> and um, sometimes we have to go out and do a lot of invasive clearing before we can even do some of these. So a lot of the work we did was pre-work to get some of these areas ready um, for planting to begin with, to give the seedlings um, a fighting chance. Um, like I mentioned, invasive removal started with some blackberry removal sometimes. Um, but we also, in addition to just the tree planting and the labor and the materials, we we're also able to do things like mulch to help keep the weeds down around them, help with moisture retention around each of the trees, and also caging because some of our areas do get um, quite a bit of browsing from deers and other animals that pass through. So um, being able to put some wire cages to protect those seedlings so they can get a fighting chance and stand up to a little bit of abuse um, should it happen was really important. We uh, succeeded, um, planted far more than what our original intent was, and we planted 11,385 trees as part of that project. Um, granted, we completed that work in 2021. Uh, took us a little longer with the pandemic, but we did succeed. Um, so 28% of them were evergreen and 72% deciduous. And a lot of it was just based upon right plants, right area, and kept making sure we're staying within the right ecosystem um, and individual areas and making sure that we were planting for success for all of those trees. Um, we plant a lot of trees throughout the city, and while the Million Trees was just one little grant, um, we plant a lot of trees through volunteer efforts, through um, events such as Green Issaquah, Arbor Day, um, Mountains of Sound, Greenway Trust does. Um, we also work with them on citywide efforts. Um, in some of our different parks and open spaces. And so there's always a lot of volunteer opportunities. And just since the pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic, as well as through the pandemic, even though we had uh, troubles gathering and working in groups and close to one another, um, collectively, we were from 2019 through 2021, we were able to plant over 16,000 trees 
um, in our city parks and open spaces during that time. And that 16,000 included the 11,000 that was part of the 1 million trees grant. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier, we're looking at the park strategic plan and the green Issaquah partnership. We are beginning to continue to train up forest stewards to take on and manage um, some of our parks and open spaces that need some restoration work. They help guide and provide all of the um, education needed as well as um, help help you with signing up and getting volunteers to help participate. Um, so if it, on any given day you want to show up and do a little tree planting or invasive removal, um, we can do that. This summer, we would like to come back and give you a more in-depth presentation on uh, Green Issaquah as we get the program really up and rolling and get some more um, opportunities. But if you want more information or you want to start participating and volunteering in some tree planting or invasive removal, please go to our link in our Green Issaquah Partnership webpage. And um, this will take you to a hyperlink that'll connect you with Forterra where all of our, it's a Forterra website where all of our different um, programs are being uh, posted and uh, planting events and opportunities. The next project I'd like to talk with you about is our carbon credit project. Um, back in early 2020, just before the pandemic hit, uh, we had gone to city council and um, shared with them this opportunity during a study sh session um, at what could be a potential funding opportunity for our urban forest management program. Um, we then, we are, we're working with our partners, City Forest Credits at that time and um, through the pandemic and as we started looking at the different opportunities we had, um, we really did a little pivot with our project and I'll explain that later, but we ended up taking back an agenda bill uh, last October to, uh, with an actual carbon credit application uh, seeking permission to participate in a national sale of carbon credits. Um, as I mentioned, the revenues generated from the sale of the carbon credits are gonna be helping to support um, urban forest management and the Green Issaquah program um, on the project sites. The carbon credit program is both the earning and the selling of carbon credits. And there's various ways you can achieve carbon credits. Um, on the next page, I have a city forest credit link, but there's tree planting projects where you can go in and plant new trees. And then also preservation or acquisition projects. Tree planting projects are a little more challenging because you have to be able to monitor them for a long period of time. There's quite a bit of work involved with carbon credit applications, um, not only in the initial application period, but also with the monitoring throughout the lifespan of these. Um, some tree planting projects you'd need to manage for, I believe it was a 25 year period of time. Um, some of the preservation acquisition projects, 40 to 100 years. So um, there's a lot more information out there. Um, as I mentioned, for our specific application that we took to city council last October, we partnered with City Forest Credits and they have those uh, tree planting protocols on their website. So if you'd like to learn more about what goes into those, there are resources that are out there um, you can look at. But City Forest Credits also serves as a certification registry. So when we get ready to sell our credits, um, what they do is they basically value uh, either the trees planted or the acquisition um, and provide you with a number of carbon credits. Uh, the carbon credits are calculated on carbon both within the tree soil that will also be generated within the canopy, but also take into consideration some of the co-benefits of like rain interception, um, carbon dioxide avoided and other air quality and energy topics. They also, um, City Forest Credits also serves, conducts a third party verification um, which is an independent review of your application to ensure that the carbon that is going to be sold um, is, is 
that's a valid quantification um, to for a potential buyer. Carbon credits, um, while there's value in freshly planted trees or in a stand of uh, trees on a newly acquired piece of property, um, there's no value in that uh, on a market <laughs> per se um, until there's an active buyer that is willing to pay for those. And um, those carbon credits will offset somebody's emissions at a different um, facility or a building or industry. Um, we still retain the property. We have to manage it. And so the revenue that's generated is basically thanking us for taking care of this forested area um, and helping provide environmental benefits. Um, our application is for our um, Bergsma acquisition that Jeff mentioned earlier. Here, here is kind of a map of the project site. It is the yellow um, the acquisition we performed and then um, our existing Harvey Manning Park. But you can see the connectivity of this acquisition and what it really meant for protection of the forested hillside and its adjacency to Cougar Mountain Regional Wildland Park, as well as um, maintaining the view shed, as well as a consistent stand of forest, because we all know the more you um, develop forests or you create different edges, there's more opportunity for invasives, habitat breaks, things like that. Um, so acquiring the site really proved to have a lot of value. Um, this project site has quite a few wetlands and streams on it as well. So from an environmental standpoint, it was really a very good acquisition. Um, like I said, the 33 acres, sorry, the picture got really grainy there. Um, Harvey Manning Park was this 33.53 acres on the hillside here. And again, the revenue that we're generating from the sale of the carbon um, will help support uh, urban forest management and the Green Issaquah Stewardship Program. Um, the sale of our carbon is supposed to occur soon. So I'm sorry, I can't get into a lot of detail until that that sale is complete, but um, I would ask that you stay tuned in the near future. Um, once that is complete, there will be more information shared about um, that. So with that, I will happily uh, take any questions. And just one thing to think, you know, it sounds great to do a carbon credit program, but there are a lot of considerations that need to be taken into place and not every project not every tree planting project is a really good one. One thing we realized with our planting projects from the 1 uh, million trees grant is we thought, oh, it'd be great. We're planting all these trees. Let's enroll them. But there's a lot of work in being able to go back over a 25 year period when you're doing a lot of infill planting. It's really difficult to be able to identify each individual tree and trying to track where 15,000 trees are or 11,000 trees and which ones may be dying um, over the lifespan of that obligation for a 25 year period for planting really proved to be a little challenging. So um, we've got maintenance reporting for the lifespan. We've got protection. There's deed and covenant restrictions that need to go on it. There's also a lot of application fees, maintenance fees on those. And so, um, not every project is really cost effective for the um, carbon credits. So it needs to really kind of also be of size and scale that makes economic sense for the lifespan of the project as well. So something to keep in mind that we've learned through this process is that not all projects are good candidates, um, but when there is one like the Bergsma property that we would be able to sell credits on, it does become very worthy for the city to embark on such an effort. And again, if you want more information on carbon credits, the com company we worked with was City Forest Credits. They're a nonprofit. Um, so please feel free to uh, look at their website. And that's all I have for presentation. We'll gladly entertain any questions the board might have of us. Thank you very much, Jeff and Jennifer. That was a great presentation. I think you answered some of the questions I got to you in advance of the meeting. But unfortunately, like all good people, I'm looking for questions from the rest of the board. I have a few more questions to ask of you. So before we go there, 
And um, the first one I have is, you know, Jennifer, you talked about the carbon credit. Is there any way the carbon credit could help the city achieve its, its greenhouse gas um, emissions reduction goal of 50% by 2030? I mean, that's the goal we have on our climate action plan. So here you're getting carbon credits, but they're also reducing greenhouse gases. And how would you, I'm just thinking, is there a way to use that to our benefit to help us achieve that? That's a great question, because um, a lot of the buyers, you know, they're buying for where they're offsetting their their emissions. They're buying in a different area, even if it's a local Seattle business, right? They're in Seattle, and how do we offset what's happening here in Issaquah? Um, that's a really good question. I know one thing um, that had been mentioned, and also in the development is the ICAP, of the ICAP, is what is just our latent um, carbon capacity within our existing forests, not looking at it on a specific acquisition or tree planting, but what is the latent capacity within some of our forest stands? So I think that's something that is definitely perhaps worth um, further conversation down the road. Jeff? Yeah, Nancy, great question. And I guess I, a clarifying question to your question, are, are, you, are you asking how might our our forested hillsides, our, our um, forested areas offset our own carbon emissions? Is that is that the connection, the nexus you're making? Yes, well, not just that one, but it seems to me that we've now acquired a large piece of property that we're using for carbon credits. And what I'm trying to do is figure out if we're planning on taking any credit for that as we try and do our own greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, not that I think we should, but I'm just, kind of thinking ahead. I mean, we've uh, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the city by 50% by 2030 is a pretty, and it's 2022, that's a big job. And um, I think just trying to think of all the opportunities, is this an opportunity? That's what I'm asking. No, I think it's a great question and worth exploring. I don't think, uh, probably none of us in this room have the answer, but I, I think it's a question definitely worth uh, uh, further expo exploration of, I, I think, you know, um, the carbon mark, I don't know that we would be monetizing our own, right, if we're offsetting our own um, um, greenhouse gas emissions, but I, I again, I, I think it's a um, really important question for us to, to continue to explore. Okay, I'm going to ask you two more questions. Sorry, and then I'll turn it over to the rest of the board. Sorry about this, but um, is there an opportunity for the city to fund more green investments since we've now adopted the climate action plan? So now you have a new tool that parks can use or public works could use or surface water could use to help say to the city council, you've made a big investment. We have to achieve this in a certain amount of time. Have you been thinking about what you could, how you could use the climate action plan to further investments that you need along the way? Uh, great question. Um, I'd say yes, but probably not enough just yet, given the, the climate action plan just, just happened. I think one, one example we've been exploring on the city facilities side is looking at how, as we are aware of some needed investments within some of our larger city facilities, I'll use the community center as, a, as an example. Um, uh, it still has its original roof. And we know that roof is going to need to be replaced here in, in the next couple of years, um, as we've identified in the, in the CIP. As we do that roof replacement, we've been talking with facilities already about how do we think of and prepare for, um, given that roof and given its southern exposure, what a great candidate is for solar. So, you know, how do we, um, as we know some of these life cycle investments are coming up, how do we position ourselves? Uh, to perhaps um, address some of those climate action goals as well. Um, and, and again, begin to make some pivots into to, um, more sustainable um, energy use. So yeah, I, I, you know, I'd say yes, but that's, that's one, I guess one small example of uh, where our own city public investments could uh, really nicely align with climate action plan goals. And the last piece to that, 
feeds with what you just talked about, Jeff, and that is I see around the city many city employees, parks employees, using gas blowers, class lawnmowers, gas, gas, gas. And I would encourage you to think about going to something different, you know, because it will certainly help the city as we try and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, as you replace us with perhaps another energy source, such as, you know, um, battery operated ones, make sure you're taking credit for those because we're going to need everything we can get by 2030. So um, just as a, I think it's time to think about the equipment you use day in, day out, the vehicles you drive whatever, so that we are starting to really make that change and making that commitment to the city council saying, this is why we're making this investment. And it may cost more now, but it is helping us to achieve that. Just food for thought. Yeah, great, great point. Great example. Thanks for that, Nancy. All right. Those were my questions off the top and now I'm gonna turn it over to my um, other board members. And Jamie, I'll start with you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, first of all, I would echo, especially Nancy's last comment around uh, and I know this is something that all city parks we're doing is is looking at ways that uh, can decrease carbon intensity of operations. Um, one of my questions, taking a step back, you, you mentioned a bunch of different uh, projects, whether it's uh, Green Issaqua, carbon credit thing. One of the areas that I'm really interested in as part of the ICAP is we have now a canopy goal of 55%. Um, I'm one of my pieces of feedback throughout the ICAP was I was not clear where that increase was going to come from. Um, I'm curious as you taking a step back, and this could be in parks, this could be elsewhere, um, where do you see the biggest opportunities to actually increase canopy cover? I think Green Squad is great. I'm actually a part of Green Squad, but that's preserving existing canopy. I'm how how are what are the biggest opportunities you see to actually increase where, where trees are that uh, on the order of magnitude of, of of getting to a lofty goal like that? Yeah, no, great, great question, Jamie. Um, probably worth future discussion. I, the good news is, I, it, yes, it's a lofty goal, but we're already at 53% as a community. So I think to get to 55, uh, let's not dismiss the importance of Green Issaquah and some of that work of really sustaining um, and looking at the quality of the 53% we already have. Um, I think within the, the um, tree canopy analysis that was done, uh, most recently there are some recommendations and there are there was some mapping to, to sort of look at um, some strategies and where we might be able to add some capacity. Uh, some of that is on some public lands. Uh, there's other opportunities, uh, quite frankly, on, on private um, uh, lands as well. So. Um, I don't know that it's any one singular strategy. Um, I think it's I think it's multiples. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that that study and the the recommendations that are in the back of that, um, uh, it, it it does it doesn't feel hopeless. It feels like there's some real opportunities for us to to make gains on the the uh, fifty three percent we're we're currently at. Thanks, Jeff. That's super helpful. And do you mind either you or state? I would love to take a look at that. I don't. I think I've seen it would probably be great for the whole board to to have absolutely. To I think yeah, be. Jen. I know, maybe we can yeah. We'll we'll send that to all of you absolutely. Yeah, happy to send that out. I did have a couple more questions. I was curious. The one million tree the grant is that grant all used up? Is that a safe assumption? It is. It has been fully expended and uh, the grant closed. But yes. Okay. Um, Next question, I'm curious, I know ICAP's really new, <clears throat> but as you're thinking about, um, I, I think it's next year, the park strategic plan is gonna be coming together. What are the biggest areas that you think that that might influence your thinking um, in, in what goes into that plan? Boy, gr again, great, great question that uh, probably deserves um, a, a lot more thought as we begin to, to prepare for that. Um, I think as we're looking at the update of that strategic plan, I think there's opportunities both in some of our operational approaches um, as well as how we're looking at, at capital investments. So um, yeah, let's, let's roll up our sleeves and, and pose those questions as we start scoping out that work. Thanks, Jeff. One one thing that I think, and this is more of a note for Stacy, that just comes to mind is I, I do wonder about 
how parks can be used as part of the education and outreach for ICAP and kind of furthering ties between people being outside and, and caring about the environment. So that, that would be a part of uh, what I hope would be uh, as part of consideration for, I don't know if it's ICAP or if it's parks strategic plan, but that does seem like a, a good opportunity to tie the two together. Um, and then I'll, I, I think that's all my, my questions for now. I'll let someone else go. Thank you. Jamie, if I could add to that, that's a great point, and I think it's a bit of both, right? I mean, I, I think a key goal of Green Issaquah is not only stewarding, but it's it's educating, um, it's creating advocacy. And so um, I think those education opportunities, whether it's Green Issaquah and sort of what, what's something bigger going on in that story uh, from a climate standpoint and environment standpoint, um, we've initiated, I don't know if a number of you have met Peter Walters, our park ranger, um, a part of the park ranger program that is just starting is both uh, making sure we're sort of an ambassador from a, um, a um, positive recreational use within our system, but also looking at um, um, educational opportunities where, where uh, Peter will be leading folks on um, trails and, and uh, perhaps you know climate um, and environment could be a really cool topic to show the the role that these public spaces are playing. Hey, we're, these aren't just areas to play. Uh, there's there's more going on uh, in these public lands. Great, thanks, Jamie, for your question. Uh, this is Nancy Davidson again, and with this, I'm going to turn it over to Dan for his comments. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Dan Hintz. Um, Speaking here, Jeff and Jen, good to see you both. Thank you for the presentation. I, I just have a few comments. I, you know, I kind of want to come back to Nancy's comment on the carbon crediting. I mean, I do think it's still a really powerful communication tool, even if things can't be credited for revenue. So um, to your point, Nancy, I mean, I think in the carbon world, you know, it, it's usually additive. So Berg's, but even if that wasn't credited, you know, if you're talking about reductions, you know, moving forward, it would be tree planting efforts or, or, or new additive uh, uh, you know, trees within the city limit. So I do think that's a really powerful communication tool. I think city forest credits has really good tools for that accounting. I tree, if you haven't looked at that already. Um, and I do think it's an important distinguishment though. It's not ne necessarily greenhouse gas reduction. It is offset, but I think that's still a really important story to, to tell and to try to document with some of the, you know, restoration and green physical efforts here. So. Just wanted to come back to that something I'm super passionate about and, and happy, obviously, to talk more about with you all. Um, Jen did an awesome job talking about the last, you know, 3 years with this million trees grant, but I think, you know. Not losing sight that the city has been so committed for the better part of 3 decades on land acquisition and restoration. I'm, I'm fortunate to work with a lot of the cities in King County and there's not many that really have that long term. Commitment to restoring spaces and you can go walk through as, as Jeff was just saying, you know, some of these open spaces, you know, that have trails, but then they're important habitat as well that are 30 year old forests that used to be nothing, you know, prior to that. So I do want to just really call out the city's long term commitment to those acquisitions to the restoration and to, you know, trying to be smart about balancing, uh, you know, those recreation in the appropriate places, places that are maybe best left a little bit more alone from people and impacts like that. Um, so I just want to call that out. That's really awesome. And I guess that would be kind of my last comment specifically on acquisitions. I mean, I, Jeff, I totally respect that. You know, obviously we can't get into individual properties, parcels, stuff like that, but I guess just a few high level comments from my point of view, I guess, with acquisitions and corridors. Um, I think we all know this, but I'll really stress that, you know, Isco Creek, Tibbetts Creek, our creeks are probably our most important wildlife corridors. Sometimes I think we think about connecting mountains and broader open spaces, but our creeks really are our most important corridors, at least in Isco, in my opinion. Um, and I'm fully supportive of, you know, connected trail networks, ways to go through, but I think it's really important to think about that sort of infrastructure and the fact that these creeks are very dynamic systems. So sometimes that might mean spending more on bigger bridges, setting trails back a little further from the creek, even though people want to see it. And I think those are trade-offs we have to consider in long-term, hopefully good investments, you know, if and when a bridge does get undercut by a big flood or something like that. So I think sometimes those are, you know, going to cost more money, but in the long run, really important for habitats. So as we consider bridges, we consider trails around Isaac Creek, Tibbetts Creek. Uh, I just think, you know, taking those kind of more conservative approach, you know, even looking at channel migration, that sort of stuff is really important. Um, and then kind of the last thing I'll say in acquisitions, I mean, just kind of going from creeks to kind of the more forested hillsides we've talked about, Bergsma's amazing. I'll say some of these more big passive open spaces, Park Point, 
Hope Creek, you know, I, I personally think those areas are so important for wildlife, north side of Squawk Mountain, you know, I, I think there's some of these spots that, this is my opinion, I'll say specifically, but, you know, sometimes are even better left alone without trails, without trailheads, without public access. And I know when we're spending public money to invest in these, we want people to be able to connect with them. But I do think there's actually probably a lot of people in this community, at least I can speak for myself, that actually would value that as a stronger community asset for wildlife connection, for habitat, um, or, you know, reasonable trail use in there too. So I, I just think that's important to kind of think about as you look at maybe these more kind of forested hillside uh, acquisitions as well. So, um, and yeah, I guess the last thing I wanted to say, going back to the Creek things, I think you do a good job about this, but continuing to work with public works on, you know, multiple benefits of, of, of flood reduction too. So I guess I'd kind of point the whole parcel or different parcels. Salmon run is a smaller scale, um, you know, work along the Pickering reach that's upcoming is really good examples of, uh, you know, habitat, flooding, land acquisition, um, all those sort of things. So yeah, anyway, thanks again for the presentation. Thanks for those comments, Dan. I, I, great priorities, um, absolutely. Um, not to meant to be a big tease for all of you, but we just just Monday night had an executive session with council around some strategic properties that have been uh, uh, some efforts that have um, been underway for for nearly a year now um, and are reaching a, a, a critical point. So. Um, it's it's an effort and multi pronged priorities. Then Dan spoke to many of those that um, uh, continue to drive um, a city that, um, like Dan said so well, it's it's been in the DNA of this community um, for for decades. Thank you for your feedback, Dan and Jeff. Your comments. This is Nancy Davidson again. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Ann, and I think she has some questions. Go ahead, Ann. Hi. And you come here. Hi, Jeff, Jennifer, thanks for coming tonight. So, um, I am wondering as you're planting all of these trees and um, native plants. Are we looking, um, into the future into the changing climate as it warms up and thinking about planting plants that. We also see maybe down in Oregon or farther south where it's warmer. Um, or working with King County, I know Kathleen Farley Wolf um, is very knowledgeable in this area. So, is that something we're thinking about as we're planting? Yes, it definitely is. And, you know, a lot of our areas to, you know, um, available groundwater, high water tables in some of these areas, runoff, slope exposure. Yeah, it, it's all stuff we consider when we're looking at the plant pellet as we um, pick, pick our plants. That's great. Good news. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, next we have Cameron Fisher. Cameron, please go ahead. Hello, this is uh, Cameron Fisher. Um, Jeff, I just want to ask you a little bit more about, uh, you touched on it with uh, responding to Jamie's questions, uh, talking about a little bit more about the, your private landowner partnerships and what you're doing. Obviously, Rowley being a large uh, property owner in, in uh, Issaquah. How, how, do you, how does the, the Parks Department work with, uh, with these private owners of large parcels? Work with them in which way? In what way, Cameron? Um, in the kind of going what uh, what Dan was talking about, the connectivity. Uh, are you help? Uh, are you working with them? Uh, they own large vacant parcels. Uh, do you help them with the the the, the revegetation of these open spaces or allocation? I know okay. Rowley's got an open space down uh, by the uh, the car dealerships there. You know, so do do you do you work with them? And how do you work with them? Uh, we do not, we work with them in terms of um, sort of looking at strategic connectivity. Um, uh, we do not work with them in terms of publicly funding um, investments on private property uh, per se. In some cases, um, we steer them towards grant opportunities. Um, um, so it's, I'd say it's probably more um, conversational and relationship building than any sort of um, you know, financial or resource uh, partnership. Thank you. Yep. Okay, this is Nancy again, and we're back to Tom Anderson. Tom, you have any some a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Tom Anderson here. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I'm familiar with the Green Issaquah program, and I'm wondering 
So how has that gone? What sort of interaction between the various nonprofits uh, in the area have you had? And, and how do you see that moving forward? If there's some nonprofits that want to get involved with that sort of thing, uh, how, how can that best happen uh, to the benefit of the overall program? Yeah, Tom, great, great question. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the stewards that we've been training and, and I think the, the, just the, this first year of steward training, I think has shown both interest by private residents, um, uh, individual residents, but also some of the nonprofits. Issaquah Alps Trails Club um, has stepped up as a, as a steward uh, themselves as an agency. I know we've been engaging with an environmental subcommittee uh, with Issaquah Kiwanis. Uh, so I think as we've just started, um, I think really um, communicating this opportunity, we've already seen a number of, of um, community groups and nonprofits step forward and, and want to partner. So uh, we only hope that that continues to, to grow uh, as that, as the prog program grows. Uh, we have a new, um, a new private entity, um, you might be familiar with them, uh, REI uh, has come to town. We've had some uh, real initial sort of welcome to Issaquah conversations with them, and uh, they've expressed a lot of interest in Green Issaquah. So uh, we just, we think those partnerships will continue to grow. I um, happened to work uh, for the city for 10 years where REI used to be, um, a city down in South King County, and uh, we too had a, a Green Cities program down there, Green Kent, and um, I can speak from experience, REI were terrific partners there as well. So Alps Trails Club's already stepped up and uh, we just, we see some of those partnerships growing. Uh, yeah, and, uh, just uh, that reminds me of a little historical note here. REI helped um, uh, the Esquire Alps Trails Club uh, back in the 90s on some trail projects. They used to be into that sort of thing. Um, anyway, that's just a historical aside. Uh, so the great presentation here to the environmental board, I'm just wondering, well, how can, how can the environmental board best help, uh, help you moving forward on this? I mean, this is, this is an informational presentation. You're not asking us to make a specific uh, decision. Uh, so what, uh, what do you see as our role in best helping you moving forward? Wow, Tom, um, I, multi pronged, I guess. So let's let's continue to further the relationship. I think as as you all are looking at environmental policies um, and you know want to be a sounding board to us, please um, uh, either through Stacy or or uh, working directly with us. Um, we work a lot. We have five boards and commissions within the Parks and Community Services Department. Um, I think probably the closest nexus in terms of land stewardship, the park board, I, I could see, you know, as, as we continue work with the park board, uh, maybe there's some opportunity for some joint meetings on, on some key topics. Um, 2023 is not going to be too far away. And as the park strategic plan update happens, um, I could see, um, uh, again, just, I think your voice and, and perspective could be really helpful there. So, um, yeah, let's, so for multiple ways. Um, yes, okay, thank you, yeah, uh, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Jeff. Um, it's Nancy again, and with this, I'm gonna turn it to Laura. Laura? Hi there, um, hey there. Um, um, interrupt me if you can't hear me. Okay, sounds a little fuzzy. Um, thank you for your presentation. That was super um, informative and exciting to hear how much work you guys have been doing, especially with planting trees in the middle of a crisis, it's kind of exciting and a big achievement. Um, I mostly wanna echo what everyone else said. I do have one question, I'll just rattle through them and you can respond as you please, but um, I'm curious what kinds of, or types of park land are most compromised. So we're working a lot to build and um, create these sustainable parks for the long term. but I'm curious what ways that you're experiencing compromise and if there are any things that the city can do to help support that better. Um, so that's my question. Aside, I um, want to echo what Jamie had said for doing the, um, and also what Nancy said about doing more with the, the ICAP. We'd love to hear from you how you see, you know, those initiatives interacting with, with public space and with park space. Um, and also even something like doing demonstration gardens or interpretive spaces so that, you know, residents in commercial areas can go and do their own um, things. It'd be nice to see if that is that an option. 
Um, for the carbon credits, I'm curious if there are other, um, like Dan was saying, like other priorities we can prioritize um, beyond with carbon credits. So beyond doing trees, are there ways to work on, you know, soil sequestration and other ways because, and with habitat, because there are so many crossovers uh, where Isquare really has so much green space and habitat that other people don't, are there more ways we can maximize? Um, and then kind of what Tom, I think it was Tom who's getting at with the um, use of, what was my question? I lost my thought, it's late. Um, with the use of non-public areas, are there other ways that we can um, support you coordinating with residences and especially with commercial spaces who might not be so traditional, but definitely could do things like green rooftops and other things um, we don't wanna add to your plate without more funding, but also be curious if those are opportunities you've looked into. Thanks for that, Laura. Great, great. Uh, you're right. I love the the questions and the and the comments in that. Um, in terms of compromised, are you are you thinking more? Are you speaking environmentally compromised? Or compromised uh, specific to the board? Yeah, environmentally compromised. Um, so yeah, places where you might be looking to provide habitat, and then that's going to be compromised just by the increased foot traffic, yeah. or ways that you know the trees I know are often damaged um, just by trees pass by cars passing by and things like that. Yeah, great question. I I think the um, you know as we did the sort of the assessment of our of our um, city public lands, I don't think it's probably no surprise that, you know, the edges of our urban forests are probably most compromised to invasives, um, you know, where we see that interface between um, sort of more active developed space and the, and the forest, we wanna pay really, really close attention to that. Um, our street trees, um, some of them are really starting to age out in fatigue. Um, I think where we're seeing climate, I think, um, I mean, take a next time you drive down Gilman, um, you know, a mix of, I think, climate change, um, old aging, dying irrigation um, and aging trees, you'll see some trees that are really in different degrees of stress. And so um, I think, you know, something we've talked about as a department and I think is very much worth a future conversation is um, how do we start strategically investing um, in street trees, uh, what are our priorities for street trees? Um, how do we make sure we have the infrastructure in place needed to sustain street trees? Um, street trees are great, but I, I think it sounds like many of you are probably aware of, of tree health. It's probably the most stressful <laughs> compromising environment for a tree to try and um, thrive and survive. So um, I, I see in terms of our urban forest, um, uh, our street trees are, are uh, probably a program in an area we're, we're going to need to really start to, to think about in the coming years. I would just like to add to that. I know street trees are being looked at very carefully as part of the title 18 updates as well. I've, um, so there, there is some definite attention being paid to that to how, as to how we can ensure, um, street tree health. I'd also like to add to what Jeff said is in the, um, Green Issaquah Partnership 20 year implementation guide, all of the lands that were enrolled in that program for Green Issaquah, um, there's a matrix that talks about habitat quality and threat of invasives. And really those that are the highest threat of invasives, but high quality um, are the, really where we're wanting to kind of focus on some of our efforts to preserve those. Some that are need a lot more work um, may not require so much action right out of the gate. You know, it's like, let's get the good going great. And then let's go focus on these areas that are really gonna need um, a hard time. So if you've not taken a look at that document, I think that's one place where um, we can really see kind of where the quality of, <laughs> Jeff's doing a little uh, promo there. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, Take a look at that and it really has all the maps and the areas very roughly graphically drawn out. But once we get out to the site and we start looking at those areas, some are a little more accessible than others. So we've been really starting some of our green Issaquah volunteer with those that are a little more accessible until we get a lot of steward strain that can maybe handle some rougher environments. But um, like Jeff said, the fragmentation 
um, and creating new margins on forested areas is really where we see a lot of our um, most immediate threats to, to our forests. So it sounds like just to follow up that one of the areas we can also support you in is is pushing Title 18 to see if to make sure that we're thinking more about the streetscape and some of the invasives as part of that. I also would hope that um, we can think beyond the traditional sort of main street look of, of Gilman and maybe update that to have um, not just a tree, but have other plants supporting it so that these trees aren't left alone um, and create more of an ecosystem for them to survive in. Okay. Thank you all for your comments. I know I still have some more. Uh, we are running long on the meeting at this point, uh, particularly on this agenda item. And I know that this talking to the parks department has been something that's been very important to this board over the last year. Um, and in talking with Stacy, um, it appears that she can put off the um, long term work plan for the Issaquah climate action plan and the performance measures and bring those back to a future meeting. So, what I'm like to do is continue our conversation with parks so that Jeff and Jennifer don't have to come back again in the near term and we can continue that. So, I'm, I just like a nod if people are a thumbs up, if people on the board are okay with putting those two items off. And if that's the case, we'll just continue on with this conversation. I just want to get everybody's kind of behind me. All right, with that, thank you all. Um, I think there's a comment from Don. Don, go ahead, please. Yeah, Jennifer, Jeff, thank you for your presentation. It was, it was very good to see you got some great programs in place. I just want to make sure that you guys are making a nexus with your public works department, because I think there's a way to help support your programs in parks. Um, you may have heard all early indications are that your stormwater utility is going to be subject to some, some higher permit requirements in the future. Um, and it's gonna, my, it very well may include things um, that you're, very, you're doing right now. Property acquisition, restoration of habitat, um, stream side enhancement areas. Um, so start those conversations now because there may be a way to leverage the the two different funds together and, and make it more of a citywide effort. Appreciate that, Don. Appreciate yeah. that, Don. We have uh, I think made some really really good headway. Not to say that it didn't happen before, but. Um, I think some of the collaboration work, some of the really strategic planning work as public works is looking at um, their own stormwater surface water master plan. Um, if they haven't been, or if you hadn't got an update on that, uh, that's that's some work in progress right now. You know, Jennifer and I've spent some real intentional time with them uh, looking at that very thing, Don. You're right, how do we, how do we achieve multiple benefits uh, within our acquisition strategies? So thanks for that comment. And Jeff, I would like to encourage you to look at other places in the city, such as the water utility and the wastewater utility. And the reason I say that is their pump stations and their lift stations are very energy intensive and likely their ability to get away from some of the uh, gas related. I know there's some electrical pieces to it, but there are some gas backups. And they're going to have to be looking for some way to get some greenhouse gas emissions. And you happen to have some abilities to get to to help them with that. So I think there's an opportunity for a win with others, you know, in transportation to try and deal with that. And the other piece I have for you is as we're looking at Title 18 and you look at commercial property owners that may want to redevelop, is there an opportunity for them to perhaps uh, plant trees or do something to help reduce their greenhouse gas emission? And, you know, I know stormwater has talked about potentially doing a bigger project instead of everybody doing, you know, the dinky one here for this parcel, you know, target this one here for Safeway, this one here for whatever the case may be. And instead combining into something bigger that's more comprehensive and does a better job managing st stormwater overall. The same thing could be true if we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions and if we're look, whatever is coming through on Title 18 with regards to that. There's an opportunity for each of these commercial properties potentially to buy into a bank or something like that. And the bank could be something parks could kind of handle along the way for helping them. Just a thought that's kind of creative out of the box. Okay, any other questions or comments for parks? Okay, we're seeing none. Well, 
I personally want to thank Jeff and Jennifer for coming tonight. I think um, I hope you got some good feedback from the environmental board and I hope you realize that we would like to be a resource to help you as you're trying to accomplish your um, goals because we're very interested in what you're trying to accomplish and hopefully we'll get an opportunity when you think the time's right to bring your information back to us. I know we'll be kind of monitoring it and probably weigh in and say when we want you to come back if possible, but thank you very much. We do appreciate your time and great presentation tonight. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, everyone. Um, it really, really appreciate the conversation. So, uh, thanks so much. Thank you both all very much. All right. Take care. Good evening. And you guys can go ahead and take off and we'll go on with the rest of our meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I lost my agenda on my other device. So with this, I'd like to turn it to um, Stacy. We still have a little more time in the meeting and uh, wondering where you'd like to go next, just because um, of time. Thanks, Stacy. Um, I think I do not want to rush the work plan conversation and community engagement conversation. So I think it would be best if we punt that. I'll see if we might be able to squeeze it into our next meeting. And ahead of that meeting, I could provide some more detail in the memo to help people better prepare for that conversation. The performance measure conversation is intended to be pretty brief if we want to go there um, and spend about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, or I could move just in, we could move into reports. So I'll defer to you on how much we want to try and cram in tonight. Well, I'd like, given that I know we have Title 18 and Title 16 coming looming in the stormwater master plan, not too far off later this year. Um, I'd like to move on to the performance measures. If the board's okay with that, you know, give me a thumb. You guys, okay, spend a little more time on this so that we don't get. So go ahead and why don't we go into the um, agenda item C, which is the Issaquah Climate Action Plan performance measures, and we'll defer the uh, long term work plan and community engagement plan to a future meeting. So go ahead. Right. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, so the topic I wanted to bring to you tonight is around performance measures for the ICAP and really want to get input from the board on how you want to engage and at what level in the development, the review and approval of performance measures. The ICAP does call for performance measure development and regular reporting. Um, so this is a part important part of our implementation plan. So performance measures are important for holding ourselves, both the city as well as the community accountable for implementation of the ICAP. They support our ability to be transparent, to demonstrate where we are making progress, and also to identify barriers so that we can see where maybe we're having trouble moving certain actions forward and work together to figure out how to overcome those barriers. I am starting to work with our performance measurement staff to ensure that we can develop measures that are smart. Um, we want to make sure that these measures are not a huge lift to report on in order to easily track them, report on them frequently. Um, we also want to make sure that um, as we move forward, what we're measuring and reporting on is really reflecting the true environmental impact. I don't know that the actions in the ICAP are at a place right now where we can do that, but that is my hope in the future that we could really um, show more of that environmental impact. Um, so over the next um, year or so, our plan is to work on updating our climate action plan webpage with a really simple tracking. Um, this actually we've done already, uh, we've highlighted uh, the different target areas within the plan, um, shown what we're planning to work on this year, shown how the community can engage, and I'll, I'll drop that link in the chat a little bit later. Um, we're starting to work on performance measure development. I think that'll happen over the next couple of months. And then in the fall, the hope is to update our webpage um, where we can show those more detailed performance measures as well as a tracking tool so the community can follow along and see how we're doing it, implementing various actions. 
Um, and then we would want to be regularly updating those performance measures um, on a, a fairly frequent basis um, so that we can really uh, demonstrate what's actively being pursued and the status. So tonight I was really uh, just interested in hearing from the board on your feedback that you have on the approach, um, but then also how and where do you all wanna be engaged? Does the board want to be involved in developing the performance measures, reviewing draft measures, or in a final approval before they go live? Um, just really curious to get your thoughts on that. And just to keep in mind that we have a lot of actions in the climate action plan. So if the board does wanna be involved in development, review, or approval, we'll wanna think through some different strategies on how we can do that most effectively. So with that, I'll turn it over back over to the board for discussion and uh, feedback that you have on this topic. All right, I'm looking for any comments or feedback that you have for Stacy at this point in time. So please so indicate in the comment box, please. In the chat box, I should say. Anybody have any feedback on the board's approach? On the approach that was laid out by Stacy. Jamie, please go ahead. Thanks, Nancy. Jamie Finch speaking. Uh, Stacy, thanks for putting this together. Um, I think the short answer is that I think we would love to, or I would love to be involved in the process as we uh, as we go along. I, I do think one of the here is that I would be interested in is just what other cities are doing. As part of their their ICAP, I think that would be a great um, starting point to to begin understanding. I know there's probably other resources out there as well, um, but but seeing how others are doing it, and and if we have any that are kind of ahead of others on on what we think uh, or role models that we could look to, that would be really interesting. But I do, I, I'm sure. Well, I'll let the, the rest of the board speak for themselves, but. Um, I'm sure we would appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the process. Um, I don't, yeah, I think probably, I don't know that we're going to have uh, all the initial ideas, but I think along the way, of once we have um, sort of a framework or examples of other cities, that would be a, a, a great uh, part of the process to get involved. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, Anne, you had a question? Anne? Yeah, I was just wondering um, at what point uh, would it be most helpful for us to get involved at the development stage or the approval stage or anywhere along the way? Yeah, thanks, Anne. That's a great question. I think that's um, that's the question I've been uh, trying to to tackle and figure out where what is the right level for the board to be in. Um, this could get to be involved, this could get very complicated if the board's interested in being involved in development of the language for each of the performance measures and is interested in wordsmithing. I think that's that absolutely could be a role. We would just want to think about how to do that um, in a, a way that doesn't um, take up too much of your all's time. Um, but I think if the board wants to be a little bit more involved in a, at a higher level, um, it could be in terms of helping us make sure that our approach is appropriate. And then as Jamie was speaking to, maybe we can show kind of a couple examples of what we're thinking in terms of presenting this information to the public and getting feedback um, on, on it, at that level, if, if that's appropriate. Yeah, and maybe if there's anything that you won't want help with, you could bring it to us. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes to move quickly, from my experience, it's it's feels nice to just like do something and then you know make it happen without a whole bunch of people having to get involved in it, which can slow it down and make it very cumbersome. So with you know, we all know that time is is a big issue here and we want to move as quickly as possible. So I would say just bring us in wherever um, it makes the most sense and would be most helpful. Great, thanks for that. Yeah, and I um, 
one of my uh, colleagues was on the line. I, I told her she could go ahead and leave because I wasn't sure if we'd get to this agenda item, but she's thinking about performance measures for the city as a whole for our strategic plan and is playing with some really interesting tools on how to present and track that data over time. Um, so working with her over the next month or two, we might be able to bring something back to the board at that point to show you what we're thinking of and get feedback, make sure it's in line with what you all um, are interested in seeing. Oh, thanks. Thank you. And I just as a comment, Stacy, typically this board has avoided wordsmithing. Mm -hmm. um, we've really been um, that's really not our role. So um, I don't hope hopefully we won't go there. I would just offer that as a comment. Great. Uh, Don, you had a comment. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. So, hi, Stacy. Um, so, my comment for you first off, thanks for looking at it from a smart approach. I think that's a great way to start out. And then understanding how difficult it can be to write relevant performance measures that are useful to you in the future. Um, I could see the board's um, role in this as, as kind of being a sounding board to ground truth these measures for you. So, so bring them to the board, let us throw darts at them. Um, you know, don't take any offense and and we can maybe we can work them out so they're really good measures for you going forward. Great. Thanks, Don. Laura, you had a comment. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I um I guess I just want to point out the that I don't think our role is to be another cook in the kitchen um, if you guys don't need it. As, you know, city council and the mayor appointed this board to provide input. And I know that you have several consultants on every project who are pushing things and several um, different initiatives. So I don't, I just don't want us to be like one more group you have to present to. Um, so I kind of would put it back on the mayor and city council and maybe some of the departments in the city and say, where do they see us? Do we need to be an advocacy board to push for what other people aren't pushing for? Or is it, is that needed? Cause I, I, I don't think that was our original goal. Um, so I'd really rather have them choose what they need to hear and then tell us and we'll see where it fits. I think that's good feedback. So, um, hopefully you got the, your questions answered, Stacy. is there anybody else that would like to comment? With that, we're going to close out this. You okay with this, Stacy? At this point, yeah, I I think that's great feedback. Um, I'll work with uh, the other staff member that I mentioned on further development of those measures. Bring them to the board. I think as uh, Don, I believe, was saying, you know, kind of that uh, ground truthing them, but then also looking at some feedback on options on how we might be presenting those going forward. So appreciate that feedback. Great. With that, we conclude that agenda item and now I'd like to move on to reports and before I turn it to Stacy, I think that Jamie has a report he'd like to make. So we'll start with Jamie. Jamie, go ahead. Thanks, Nancy. Jamie Finch speaking. Um, yeah, so I wanted to provide a report out on the capital Fan finance community task force, which I always try to make sure I have all the <laughs> words in that name. Um, and so I think I've mentioned in the past that, uh, Basically, the, the goal of this task force, and it was uh, people chosen or not chosen, but um, from uh, a lot of the different city commissions and task or and boards, as well as a few community members um, to help put together a recommendation around. Um, if you remember, we looked, we had the CIP uh, capital improvement um, plan, and there was a bunch of projects within that that aren't currently funding. That aren't currently funded. We don't have an identified funding source for them. And so the task of our, our group was to come together and identify what should be the priorities for uh, the city, go out and look at funding um, projects within kind of different buckets. So think about parks, transportation, facilities, uh, utilities, and, and as well as uh, not only the the types of projects, but also how we might go about funding them. Uh, and so we're getting towards the end of that process um, in some of the, the, the primary items that we've really spent a lot of time on are, first of all, understanding uh, there's some really interesting data on uh, what the community's feedback is on what our priorities for them, as well as their satisfaction with different aspects of what the city provides today. Um, that was a really valuable resource that 
if you haven't taken a look at it, I think is, is really interesting. Um, as well as understanding all the different revenue tools that we might have. So talk, thinking of like a, a sales tax that might support um, transportation projects, for example, or a, a, a property tax levy that supports parks uh, programs or uh, projects. And so um, we've spent a long time kind of learning about uh, different, um, different tools and, and where we're landing uh, and I think next meeting will actually have a, uh, the final, I think at least close to the final recommendation and, and be discussing it with the mayor is that, um, transportation and primarily transportation, um, as it was highlighted by the community survey, um, as being something that was really important and also something that the community wasn't satisfied with the current state of, um, of, of getting around the city. Uh, was the area that that came out far ahead of all the other areas as a as a priority um, to be looking at for uh, for funding unfunded projects and one of the tools that I mentioned before is is a, a, a TBD sales tax so like a, a transportation benefit district that would look at um, to be supporting some of these unfunded transportation projects. Um, one of the reasons being is um, Isqua being a regional center, you have a large number of people that are using Issaquah uh, on, a, on a regular basis that don't actually live in Issaquah. And so the sales tax, while it does have some downsides in that it's a, it's a regressive tax, but it does also spread around um, the, the costs of, of transportation in particular, uh, projects by having people that are coming and using Issaquah as a as a regional center, um, helping to fund part of the cost for that. So that was that was the top priority as well as the the, the proposed funding approach. Um, another uh, one that is closely related to what we've been talking about today was uh, on a, a slightly longer time frame and and not not. Uh, uh, not to say it's not a priority, but but just uh, transportation being the first, this being the second was around parks and and really having interest in looking at a metropolitan parks district, which would be a property tax based um, revenue source to help us fund a lot of the unfunded parks projects that are, that are out there. Um, there's a bunch of other things I, I'd encourage anyone that uh, has interest that either our next meeting or will also be presenting at the city council meeting. I think it's the first meeting in March. I can't remember the exact date, um, the, the recommendation. But if you have interest, there's a lot more, I, I don't wanna take too much time, but there's a lot more beyond those two really big ticket items that, that will be a part of the recommendation. Uh, but I'd encourage you to take a look. I do think, um, it, it, for me, it's been a really valuable process. Um, and I think, uh, there's a lot of benefits in both of those bucket areas for the um, for a lot of the the things that we're looking at. I do think that one of the areas that will um, it wasn't discussed as a separate bucket um, was ICAP, and I do think that hopefully we can find ways to incorporate as we look at transportation or parks ways that uh, that when we do and hopefully do identify funding sources and uh, projects that are complementary to, to the ICAP, because that wasn't a specific way that we looked at uh, projects. But uh, yeah, happy to answer any other questions. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of meetings. It's something we, we meet uh, quite frequently, uh, but it's been a, a really valuable process uh, and, and something that I think we're ending up with a good result um, that will then be used by the mayor and city council to inform next steps on what the city might focus on. Um, so not a, by no means binding, but uh, hopefully we'll, uh, uh, we'll um, direct us on, on a good path. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. Does anybody have any questions for Jamie on the work that he's been putting into this? Seeing none, um, I'm going to turn it over now to Stacy to um, complete her report as well. Great, thanks, Nancy. Um, 
few things to update folks on. Uh, just as I mentioned at the last meeting, a reminder that we have four positions on this board that will end in the spring. Uh, we encourage all those folks um, seeing those positions to reapply to be on the environmental board. The application deadline is five o'clock on February the 28th. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to the clerk's office. I will just put in the chat the link to the um, application materials for those that are interested. Um, at this time, I don't have any updates on in person meetings, but I'll keep the board um, informed as I learn more. Um, I wanted just to let the board know that I'll be meeting with uh, the People for Climate Action Issaquah chapter next Monday, the 14th. Um, I'm gonna, I was planning to talk to them about the ICAP implementation plan, both the um, information I presented to you all at the last meeting, as well as what I had planned to discuss today, um, as well as in community engagement plan. So looking forward to getting their feedback on that. Maybe it'll help uh, inform for a, a better presentation to you all um, at our next meeting. Um, a few updates on ICAP implementation. Um, some of you, and I, I may have mentioned at the last meeting, um, are aware that we are trying to advance a heat pump campaign similar to um, the Solarize campaign that was run a couple of years ago. We are continuing to work through discussions with the nonprofit partner on that to ensure that the focus of the that there would be a meaningful focus of the campaign on equity. Um, we are also starting to explore some other avenues in case we can't come to agreement with the nonprofit and we are able to move forward with them. Um, but it is a partnership with um, uh, multiple cities on the east side uh, trying to run that campaign forward. Uh, Jamie, it looks like you have a question. Thanks, Stacey. Um, I just had a question. I participated in a People for Climate Action webinar recently that there was discussion around, I think you may have attended as well, around, I think it's a state limitation on utilities, uh, uh, like incentivizing switches in fuel types for mm -hmm. heating. Are we, I, I was just curious, first of all, I, I think that's correct if I'm wrong, <laughs> please, please correct me. Uh, but are we engaged on that conversation at all, or, or do we have any updates on the status of of that? I don't know if it's legislation or or what it would end up being, but just curious if you have any updates on that topic. Yeah, thanks. I'm not aware of that, um, Jamie. So I'll see if I can find out some more information uh, from the other cities or from uh, PCA. Great. Um, so hoping at our next meeting or in April, I'll be able to provide some more update on that on the heat pump campaign. Um, the other item we're working to advance is the community climate challenge. Um, we're hoping to go to contract with the partner on that campaign soon. Um, I'll talk more about it the next time I'm able to present to you the implementation plan in detail, but just as kind of a preview, I'll drop in the chat. Um, Redmond, who has launched their climate challenge as a pilot program, um, and this is something that we'll be uh, uh, doing again with a number of east side cities um, following after Redmond's uh, pilot. Um, a few other updates on ICAP implementation. We're working on a number of contracts for waste outreach and education. Um, as well as some collection events that we'll be running in the early summer as well as the fall. We're starting to explore several ideas around building energy efficiency as well as municipal projects. Um, again, hope to be able to bring more details and more information to you in the coming months. Um, and then also um, starting to scope out some work on a vulnerability assessment that we're hoping to pursue this spring into the early summer so that it'll align with the update to our emergency management plan. Um, and then the last thing, as I mentioned in my email to you last week um, and earlier tonight, that we did get our climate action um, page updated on our website. Huge thanks to Brianna, our intern, um, who's taking notes tonight, helped a lot with this language. Um, so please check that out, give us feedback. It's kind of the simple um, page right now for what's underway uh, this year, and then we'll be building out the performance measures from there. And then the last item I just wanted to mention was um, 
just to talk about the meetings that are coming up. Um, we did make some adjustments to the board uh, meeting schedule uh, based on the feedback from last meeting, but then also after conversations with public works and thinking about how to ensure we could have enough time for meaningful conversation on the um, variety of topics that they're bringing to the board uh, this spring and summer. Um, I will continue to update that board schedule and include it in your meeting packet, uh, seeing it very much as a living document. It will um, be adjusted as things evolve over time. So in terms of some of the upcoming meetings, just as a reminder, uh, we will meet February 24th with um, PPC as part of the Title 18 public hearing. Um, I did send out a little bit of information to the board on what to expect at that public hearing, um, but it is very much an opportunity for um, the commission to hear from the environmental board. They're looking to hear your voice at that meeting. Um, so please do um, take a look at the materials as they come out um, and we look forward to hearing your comments. Our March 9th meeting, um, this is the regular environmental board meeting, but PPC will be joining us. Um, to hear about the stormwater co code update. We've decided to focus that meeting on the stormwater code update instead of discussing that as well as a number of the, um, the water plan updates as well. Um, so we're hoping we'll be able to have an in-depth conversation just on that topic uh, along with um, PPC. And then we'll meet the next day. Um, that'll be our, our Third joint meeting with PPC, but it'll be the second public hearing for Title 18. I know this is a lot of uh, meetings and some back to back meetings, um, but our staff are trying to get all the feedback that's needed um, in order to uh, hit the deadlines that they have. Um, so please reach out if you have any questions about those upcoming meetings um, or the board schedule, and happy to um, take any questions on those topics. Anybody have any questions? Great. Well, thank you very much, Stacy, for that. And is there any other reports from any other uh, board members tonight? Seeing none, um, I think that concludes the business that we have agreed to complete tonight. I think some of it's going to get carried over and we'll try and figure out the best place for that. And with that, we will have another meeting on the 24th of this month with PPC. And I think that starts at 6 p.m., correct? Or 7 p.m.? That's uh, 6 p.m., I believe is correct. Yeah, so it's going to be an earlier meeting and it'll be chaired by PPC. So with that, I'm going to um, adjourn the meeting and thank you all for your time tonight. Great meeting. See you guys. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night.